Good evening. For members of the public participating in person, please submit a speaker card to the clerk before or when the item begins. For members participating by Zoom, please raise your hand using the raise hand button or star nine on your telephone. Comment will be received first from the public participating in person, followed by those participating by Zoom. Reminders, in Zoom, lower the hands after an individual has spoken. For those connecting by telephone, only call out the last four digits of the phone number. An individual may speak once on any agenda item. General public comment is for any item not listed on the agenda. Speaker cards, speaker cards received in person. I'll read out, we'll read out the names and speaker card by Zoom, the clerk will read out the names. Call the order, Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, roll call, please. Here. 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 Yes. Here. Here. Okay, uh, let's cover minutes. Do we have any edits or a motion to approve for the minutes of December 8th, 2022? Motion to approve. Second. Okay, minutes are approved. Okay, we're gonna go to the um, item number two, and that is if we have any awards, introductions, recognitions, or presentations. Is there anything that we have here? We do have a presentation for you this evening. I'm gonna pull my mask off so you can hear me a little bit better. And I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully I can do this properly. All right. Okay, Parks and Rec Commission, here we go. So I know you all know who I am, but for the benefit of the audience over here, my name is Matt Gruber. I'm the landscape architect for the city of Pleasanton. Here with me, I have Heidi Murphy. She's the director of library and recreation. And we've got a presentation for you about Ken Mercer Sports Park uh, at your request at the last meeting. We have some items that you wanted us to talk about and some items that are new items that we didn't know about in December that are extremely important to the operations of Ken Mercer Sports Park. So starting off a bit, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the cricket field construction and where we're at in that process. Uh, and then the, the new item is this critical power issue that we are facing at the sports park right now. And we're gonna go through that and the impacts of that, uh, the scheduling impacts. And then we're gonna finish off by talking about adult softball league. And, and then we're gonna open up for questions. Uh, so about the cricket design, uh, we're in the middle of the design right now and we're moving along uh, as we had planned. We expect to have construction beginning in spring 2023. We're still on target for that. We were hoping to have it starting a little bit earlier in spring, but it might start a little bit later in spring. Uh, we're working on some design details that we need to flesh out, such as what type of synthetic turf we're going to use for the pitch. Um, and we're pretty close to doing that. We are doing some additional site visits for the project because we want to make sure that we get this project right uh, to determine what type of synthetic turf we should be using or if we should be using some alternative type of servicing. So we're going to try and see a couple fields around this area, uh, existing cricket fields to make that determination. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the timeline we're looking at is uh, starting construction in spring. Um, it's more likely to be maybe March or April. And then we're expecting uh, likely two to three months, uh, most likely two months for the construction period. And then we're looking at resting the new grass areas that we installed to replace the infill that you see um, on the photo over there. Um, so it has time to establish. So there'll be a time period that the, that area is going to be um, uh, cordoned off for, for a few months, and we expect to be able to open cricket by fall. 
and the other fields around the cricket field would open up sooner than that because they won't have new grass. Great. And then just building on um, why this timeline, we really did do a lot of thinking about this um, and our fields are heavily impacted year round. So they are closed November to February. Programmatically, that would be an awesome time to do construction. Um, but as you can tell from the weather, that is a terrible time for actual construction projects. So we don't typically um, have construction projects of this nature during those wet months. Um, so we did look at summer, we looked at fall, we looked at spring, uh, they're all heavily utilized. Summer is the most heavily utilized with large scale tournaments, um, kids out of school, those fields are used all the time by all of our sports groups. So summer was out, um, fall and spring, both equally as impactful and starting in spring allows us to get the cricket pitch up and running sooner for our cricket community that's waited seven years for a field. So we're excited to be able to do that for them. So we sent out an email to all of our adult softball managers, informing them of a need to pause the softball season while we navigated the impacts of construction on all of our various user groups, including adult softball. While we were reviewing the cricket construction footprint and timeline and working with youth sports organizations to adjust practice and game locations, we were notified of a significant power issue at the Ken Mercer Sports Park that required the immediate shutoff of power to the entire park. The system short-circuited during the storm events, and as you can see, our building out there is um, red tagged. So our staff currently is working in the library. They're being very flexible, which is wonderful. Um, this uh, further complicated and already particularly challenging situation. And in order to be proactive and make sure that everyone who wanted to play softball this upcoming season was able to play, we compiled a list of all local adult softball leagues and shared that with the softball community. This was done because we know how important activity, connection, and team sports are to health and happiness. We also called all 89 softball team managers to discuss the issues. Most of these managers were very understanding of the situation see if I can help. Um, and so we we talked with all of them. We have had, um, sorry, I can't get my notes to move down. One moment, please. Oh, scrolling, beautiful. Um, <laughs> so as of today, the power situation is still evolving. This is the part I really needed my notes for. Right now, the main power service for the entire park is off and it affects the following areas, the irrigation controllers, the park's maintenance shed, the softball complex building, the overhead softball field lights, the parking lot and pathway lights, and the restroom lights. This week, if you've been out to Ken Mercer Sports Park, you'll notice that there are temporary power poles being installed. We've gotten several questions about them already. Um, and these will provide power to the parking lot and pathway lights, the restroom lights, the irrigation controllers, and the softball complex building. Temporary power is being pulled from various sources, such as recycled water pumps and other nearby locations, and is unable to support the amp load of the overhead field lights um, and also the elevator in the softball complex building. Generators are not feasible for the overhead lights due to the significant cost. A long-term power solution is expected to take approximately one year to implement due to multiple issues, including the upgrade of the system, supply chain issues, and the permitting and approval process with PG&E. With over 7,000 individual field sport players in our community, an overlay field system at Ken Mercer Sports Park, Title IX requirements, and most sports playing year round, small impacts on our field system result in large domino effects throughout the programming. These graphs represent the usage in 2019. Our usage does vary by year, but we pulled this year because it was the last full year of programming prior to the pandemic, so most normal um, pre-pandemic. We've worked to find creative solutions to navigate these impacts for 2023, focusing on best serving our residents. We recently sent out a survey to all adult softball players to gauge interest in a weekend softball league. We were pleased with the response and look forward to launching a weekend league this spring. While this is not a full-scale evening league as hoped, we believe it is a great compromise considering all of the challenges. This allows us to leverage all four fields at the adult softball complex, the fluctuating daylight hours, and ultimately accommodate all user groups. We plan to be back to a full adult evening softball league in 2024 when power is restored. 
Matt and I are happy to answer any questions you might have. We also have Aaron Bueno here, our sports and aquatics manager to respond to questions. Thank you. Oh, very good. Uh, Commissioner Brown, do you have any questions? No? Commissioner Berbersh? When does norm when does uh the softball normally start the leagues? March. March. Okay, no further questions. Commissioner Deckert, no questions. Commissioner Rittmill. Commissioner Fields. Um, I'm looking at um the graph that shows um 151 uh respondents. And it looks like uh, the majority um, would um, support Saturday and Sunday. Am, am I correct on that? That's correct. And what, I'm sorry, but what does the orange and the blue represent? It's just different colors. So you can tell the different sections oh, okay. of the pie. So if I'm looking at this, it looks like 70% of the softball uh, adult league would be in favor of the weekends? 70% of those who responded. So typically um, on a survey, we, we get a, you know, about a 10% response rate, which we've gotten here. Um, but softball, we think um, is more significant than that because usually the team managers respond on behalf of the players. So we have 89 team managers. And so we're hoping that the bulk of them are in these survey responses. Okay, so but but we don't know. We don't know. Okay. No. Okay. Thanks. Commissioner Amadi. On this sorry, on a similar lines, is this survey sent out to the all the community, like all the stakeholders, all the all the players, including the managers of the Yes. Okay. And how much do you think? the percentage of respond like 151 respond like respondents equal to 10 percent so it's 10 percent of last year's league that's okay, a 10 percent response rate okay thank you that's all from my side okay very good um it's time for public comments do we have any zoom uh callers right now that have interest in speaking no but you would take the folks yeah, here I, first I yeah. so right now we don't nothing so far okay good the reason i asked for that first okay. is gotcha. because we have we have seven speakers and we had a request from one of the speakers very um, politely asking if we could extend uh, what we normally have is three minutes. And I'd like to compromise instead of going to five to go to four, if we can go to four minutes, let's do that. Let's find that happy medium. So if we can go to limit your, um, your comments to four minutes, that would be great. Can we reset the timer on that? Okay, they'll reset the timer for us. And then we'll get ready. Um, Jim, Jim Liston will be the first speaker. If Jim, if you can get um, Good evening, my name is Jim up. Liston. Nice Jim, not quite yet. Jim, let's try to get. We're trying to get the timer reset. Is that an easy process to do? It's done. Reset. Okay, Jim, go ahead. Okay. So my name is Jim Liston. Pleasure to meet y'all. I want to start off on a positive note and say that I don't think I've ever been to a park in Pleasanton that hasn't been well kept. And when I've had people come to visit, the first thing they notice is how well the parks are kept. Um, I'm here primarily tonight because I'm a softball guy, um, and I'm hoping to maybe offer what may be a solution to salvage some of the softball season. One of the reasons why I'm really concerned about it is this. Um, a lot of the softball community feels like they were basically kicked to the curb. Um, that the decision to build the cricket pitch, which, by the way, um, is needed because I happen to go to Ken Mercer Park almost every weekend year round to hit. And I also go to Upper Bernal. And in one corner of Ken Mercer, there's guys playing cricket. And over at Lower Bernal, there's guys playing cricket. And Pleasanton's an inclusive community. So we acknowledge the need. Um, has a contractor been onboarded for this job? We can't answer questions directly. Okay. So just go ahead and run through. So my concerns is I'm in the construction business, and I know that um, – when projects go out to bid, especially in this economy, a lot of times what happens is, especially with cities, they end up in rebid. My hope is that as part of the solution, um, this group will consider starting the project in September. And I have a couple of reasons for that. One, 
we could accomplish 40 games a week, two games a night at the complex if we started softball March 12th, daylight savings time. It would require a little modification as far as uh, the normal four three count would need to go to one ball, one strike with no fouls for an out. Basically, we could squeeze in two games a night. What that would do, um, one, it would keep the softball community together. Some of the people that I've talked to are basically dismayed and softball after COVID had finally started coming back in Pleasanton. And Pleasanton isn't just a Pleasanton softball facility. We have guys coming from Fremont. We have guys coming from um, Danville. We've got guys coming from neighboring communities to play in Pleasanton for a couple of reasons. One, the facility. Two, the level of play. Pleasanton right now is probably the best location to play softball in Northern California. Um, I understand that, you know, generation power is expensive, but it might be a short-term option. I mean, theoretically, you're only going to need it for me to, well, actually, it's about $10,000 a month. I don't know if softball is self-funding or if the city has to supplement it. Uh, my understanding is that it is. My other concern um, with the project in general is this. Softball in Pleasanton supports the local businesses around the park. A lot of guys go and drink beer. Um, they go to the pizza shop, the hop yard, you name it. There's a lot of small businesses there. They're just coming out of COVID. The other thing is, is that losing the facility on the weekends impacts the community and the economy because Pleasanton hosts numerous softball tournaments, adult uh, men's U-Triple-S-A, uh, AST girls. I believe that the Pleasanton girls. 20 seconds, Jim. Put a big tournament on. With that in mind, maybe we can find an option to delay the start of the project. Thank you very much for your time. And I hope we can come to something that's reasonable. Thank you, Mr. Liston. Next speaker, Mr. Joe Silva. Yes, everybody has four. I'm Joe Silva. Uh, I sent you all an email, uh, detailed email earlier today. Um, I don't know if you got it. If you didn't, I have hard copies here if you had any chance to read it. I think there's a lot of important details there that should be addressed. Um, so the decision faced the commission is whether to have a viable softball league in Pleasanton. Not just for this year, but for years in the future. Make no mistake. Canceling the program or limiting it to a handful of teams will damage the program for years to come and could make the program no longer viable. This is certainly not the intent of the council when they approved the cricket field. The email laid out all the problems with canceling the season and detailed how a softball season could be held this year. I'll just summarize the questions that need to be answered, offer my support, and make, some and make a suggestion on the best path forward. Um, questions that I think they need to be answered. Why are the adult softball players taking all the pain in the current plan? We're taking it all, not having a season, basically. Sunday, Saturdays and Sundays is, really won't work. First of all, kids play on Saturdays and Sundays, as I said in my email. Uh, second of all, the guys are all dads. The women are moms. They have family. They have yard work. They work during the week. They want to play in the evenings. Weekends are not going to work, and they will also kill tournaments. So why are we taking the brunt of it, all of it, really? How many games will we displace by the cricket field each night and how many nights? That's important to know. I've not been able to get that information. Um, I believe that practices are taking priority over games and that's causing some of the problems. I think that should that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, the new field is going to be multi-use. Is the grass suitable to handle multiple uses? Um, when's the staff going to have the design finalized? Spring is really vague. June's in spring. Uh, you got to have an RFP, you got to have bids in, you got a winner selected, you got to have actual construction scheduled. Are we sure there's enough time to get that field installed this year? In the worst case, we're looking at the same situation next year. How many games are being played at other lighted fields in the city? I'm relatively certain that if you take away practice times, you got game times available in Upper Bernal, maybe even Lower Bernal. 
Given the current load the staff is on the staff, they're really busy right now. Is the is it prudent to delay the field construction until all the issues can be resolved in a field fully designed? I'm not sure how we can play 89 fields in one day on a Saturday or a Sunday either. Also, by the way, that that um, survey did not give us the option to play during a week. It was weekends only. We did not. That would have been the vote. Trust me. I realize staff has put in many hours in the current plan, and the inertia is difficult to overcome. But I believe it is in the best interest of this commission and the city of Pleasanton to have an adult softball program. I, as well as others, have offered to help solve the scheduling issues. We stand ready to be partners with the city to find solutions for all that are for everybody concerned. In summary, adult softball is taking all the impacts, which will lead to serious damage and the possible end of the program. It will also be de detrimental to the bars and restaurants in the area. This was not the intent of the council, nor is it a good solution for the city. As I laid out in my email, there are solutions that can be considered and that will work. However, time is of the essence and a decision will be made, need to be made in, within a week to save the program. As you can see, there are many issues to be worked out and not enough time to do it. Therefore, it is my recommendation that in the best interest of everyone, we should press pause on the start of field construction until next year so that the issues can be resolved in the best interest of all programs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Silva. Does anybody need a copy of my? Nobody got one. If anybody needs one, yeah. right? Everybody got one. Okay. Yeah, we got. This, um, I just want to make sure. Got the email this this morning. Thank you so much. Uh, next speaker, I think it's uh, Ed Santero. Hi, Ed Santero here. Uh, I've been playing softball on those fields when first day they were built back in uh, 84, 85. And um, it's a shame that we're not going to play this year. And we have second generation playing on my team for 32 years. We've been running. And I just feel Ken Mercer, who built that sports park, he's rolling in his grave right now, thinking that you're going to tear that, that field up when two blocks from here, there's dirt ready to be laid with grass and put the cricket field over here at uh, Bernal. It's a brand new sports park. Why isn't that a consideration? Um, how many teams do we have in Little League in girls softball, right? We don't know that. Uh, I have a good friend of mine who was Little League president 10 years ago, the height of Little League. My son was 10 years old. There was eight teams in every division. We had Pleasant National, Pleasant American, Foothill. Every team was busting. There was plenty of fields that, on that that weren't even used. And right now, I guarantee you there's not that many kids playing Little League. So there's plenty of fields on that sports park that can be used. Um, you don't have to use adult softball fields. Uh, you need to talk to the Little Leagues, see how many teams they have. And... I really feel that it should be postponed or reconsidered. And to me, there's so much dirt over here. I just drove by it today. And it would be a great spot for the cricket field. You wouldn't displace anyone. And it's just ready to be something to be built there. So have we considered that? Is that in the planning um, over there? I guess you can't answer questions, but uh, that's a question I have. So. Um, yeah, I hope you guys have, you know, thought this through because like the last two guys, softball's huge in this town. It's been played forever and, um, hate to see it go because if it does go this year, we're not coming back. I just know it. It's not going to come back like it is now. So you're, you're going to kill softball. And, uh, there's many other spots. I think you can put this cricket field. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, Glenn Salling. I believe it's Salling. Yeah. Salling. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah, how are you doing? Good evening. Uh, my name is Glenn Salling. Uh, I'm a manager of adult softball since 2018 and been playing for a number of years even before then as a player. Um, I first want to speak to the survey. So I really wish a survey had given a fifth option that you didn't want any of those options. I actually took the survey. And I didn't select any of those, but then submitted the survey and it took it. And there was no representation for people that actually viewed the survey, but didn't think those four options were viable. So I wanted to say that first. Mm -hmm. um, my second thing is uh, that sports complex 
seems the perception to me is it's built for adult softball. The times it's not being used, it's locked up. It's not being used for other uses for the majority of the time. And even coming out of the pandemic, when we had a short six game league, the league said we're only doing six games because we want to give opportunities for other groups to participate on these fields. But nothing else happened. There was no kickball leagues. There was no youth leagues. There was nothing. There was a six-game league, and then they were locked up. So with that in mind, it, there's been this kind of like underlying thing over the last, I don't know, five or six years probably, that the people that are in power of running the softball leagues could care what, less whether the leagues operate or don't operate, which is unfortunate because there's a great community of softball players, men and women from this community, that it's a positive outlet. It's a joyful thing to go there and get together with people from your community. And then just like uh, Jim and Lamenin, you know, you go to some of these businesses, the Hop Yards and Porky's Pizza and these places afterwards, and, you know, it's great crossover dollars. You know, people are filling up their gas tanks, you know, so there's, there's quite a significant impact with that. And with all that said, it was unfortunate to me that I kind of found out this whole situation through the kind of misleading vague email that I received after the fact, but it would have been nice if we could have been notified beforehand that we could have been represented with a voice at the city council meeting. That was out of the other groups that were represented, the adult softball wasn't represented and it greatly impacted them. So you know, for me, I would I would have liked to known, hey, why is it important for these other groups to offset softball and not important for softball, which, again, the perception is that field and complex is built for softball. So why are they the first group that's being dismissed? And why? And it just seems like now there's kind of like a an after effect of like, well, we made this decision, but now let's try and build things up to support our decision. And if this critical power issue is so critical, how come it isn't at the top of the list? I drive by the park every night. I see a dark park that looks to me like a hazard. There's still people out there walking their dogs. There's still people trying to utilize the park regardless. Why, if that's a critical thing, how come the resources aren't being put towards that to start with. Because honestly, I'd, I'd like to see that the power issue is the number one thing. And aside from that, we need cricket. We need other things to happen. It's, it's a diverse culture that we have here. We have- 15, 15 seconds. Okay, thank you. So my whole thing is, I'm not saying that I want all softball. I just want to be included. And if that means even that we have a five game season, so be it. Give us a little spot. Give us a month or two months to do something instead of just saying it's you're dismissed for this year. But thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Tim Voss. Tim Voss is next. Hello, Tim Voss. I've um, been a resident here for 40 some years, played softball probably for the last 20. Um, I talked with the mayor recently, and she assured me that there was no intent to impact a softball program to make accommodation for some new sport. And um, it seems like somehow we've gotten to the point of an inversion in priorities. And I'm kind of wondering about the governance here. How is it that your council approved going ahead with plans that have this impact on existing programs? I think it's clear that this city has got to stand up for existing programs. These leagues have been here. They paid the fees. And I'm talking about, you know, all of them. Softball, soccer is heavily represented in the park. Um, I think you have to respect the existing leagues, teams, management, and so on, and players before you consider additions. The other thing is... Um, the sports park should not be the only answer for every new sport that comes along. You cannot overlay everything onto that, uh, you know, application. 
So certainly the city, I, I'm sure, is looking at other options for parks, but I think you guys have gotten somehow ahead of yourselves. And now a lot of things have come to light, power being one of them, but the priority really ought to be on supporting the existing programs first before you consider new additions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark, I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name. Thank you, Mark. Mark Muntz. Thank you. Long time Pleasant and resident. I've been playing softball out there. Started in 1987. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. The church league. Um, basically, I came here tonight because um, the vetting process for the cricket pitch in the Ken Mercer Sports Park um, seemed to ignore adult softball because I was a little blindsided with the announcement, the emails that were sent out to the coaches. Um, it surprised me. I immediately emailed a um, city council member that I knew and CC'd the mayor. And all of a sudden, early Sunday morning, they both respond to me and they're saying, hey, this is uh, not what we approved of. Uh, you know, they almost seemed a little blindsided by the announcement of the postponement and possible cancellation of adult softball in 2023 and so I went back I went to the recreational meeting that you had that approved the cricket pitch and I know there's ballistic United soccer and youth football and I barely saw any comments about adult softball before the vote uh, I think Chuck had the he alluded to it at the very end of the meeting what I read in the notes um, he said We'll have to see how this impacts adult softball, but there wasn't really a representative in like the gentleman mentioned here before. It would have been nice to have some input before you made a vote on that, something that major. Talking about 90 teams, uh, 1,200 players. Um, and so that surprised me because it, it kind of blindsided me. Plus the survey that they sent out, it wasn't, hey, do you want a cricket pitch in the sports park rather than Bernal Patelco Park? It was more, what option do you like? And that was the same criticism I have from this latest survey about when we should play on the weekend. Yeah, those times, a lot of people have kids and um, just uh, Saturday mornings, 8 a.m. or Sunday mornings, 8 a.m. Um, but uh, one of the survey responses initially was just, uh, I, I we don't think, uh, you know, we didn't really have that choice of speaking out. It was just, which option do you prefer? But um, as a previous speaker said, I think delaying or even if it's September um, or postponing so you can have a softball season because it's it, quite frankly, a lot of us were blindsided by this announcement. And um, and then when I look back at the records, it, it just didn't seem like um, in the vetting process that we were even given a voice. Um, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission it was just kind of like this is a done deal and um it's like uh there was no voice from us before it was decided um but so my solution is maybe delay it a little bit so you can have a softball league um and uh a possible postponement till next year uh uh, because you're going to impact a lot of people. And like the other previous speaker said, Ken Mercer used to come to our Tuesday night softball league. Um, he was a big fan. I don't know how he would react to this decision to displace uh, youth sports and cancel us um, for uh, a new sport, a cricket pitch. Um, but um, anyways, I just came to express um, um the feelings of the at least the adult softball uh, community, because we did feel like we were kind of blindsided by this decision. And judging from the reaction of city council and mayor, seemed like they were a little surprised by it also. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Our final speaker with a card is Nathan Yabaralaza. Nathan, I think you spoke last time at our meeting. Yeah, I got this on the agenda. Uh, I noticed that they didn't use all of their time. Can I use some balance of their time? <laughs> let's let's just try to stay to four. Uh, they didn't yield to me. Sorry. Let's just okay. try to stay to four. Okay. Uh, well, let's just get down to it. 
Uh, so I came here last time, got this on the agenda, and since then I've really tried to untangle this thing. Went back, I looked at all the meeting, all the meeting minutes, all the agenda items, and uh, the attachments. So obviously the long history here is that you first tried to push this out of Muir Woods and the uh, public pushed back and then that fell through. So this is your second attempt and you're doing it at Ken Mercer Sports Park now. And I echo the comments of many of these other softball players, members of the community, some, some come here, um, that yeah, this is probably not the best place to do it. My, you know, just I'll jump right into it. My proposal is you go with your Greenfield site, <clears throat> excuse me, Greenfield site plan, and you know, find a place for these guys that have a cricket pitch that's nice. Give them lights. Give them the whole shebang. You got 500k. I looked into it. Make it happen. Like, quit fooling around and having members of the community have to come before you. And I guarantee you, you know, I, I think a chunk of these guys will be at city council next week too. So, uh, yeah, basically, uh, and I also think there's kind of a little bit of disconnect from what you guys are doing in library and recreation. And what you guys think is going on, right? A lot of these uh, surveys are kind of framed. Uh, what I find interesting is this a survey provided to you at the uh, 8, 12, 20, uh, 22 meeting. There, was, there were like three surveys in there that's overwhelmingly, nobody wanted any of the locations. About six, every time 66% of the people said no. Location one, 66, no. Location two, and so on and so on. That was never even discussed in this meeting, right, on 812. You were just like, well, this is what we got from the survey, and we think location two or one, and so on and so forth. I did notice that there was a attempt to try and consider the Adult Softball League during that meeting. I also want to bring up the fact that before that meeting, I think Sports Council, which I don't know if their meetings are publicly held or not, reached out to youth sports and let them know what was coming down the road. That would have been a really great time to reach out to the softball community, right? Uh, you, you, you know, you know, you have all the managers' emails. That would be a perfect time to say something. But radio silence to us, right? So that's kind of another issue. It's a little. I have to admit, it's a little dubious, right? I think this. Um, what we have right now is kind of you're pitting one adult sport against another, right? So we have this existing established adult sport. And you're saying, okay, well, we need to make this thing happen. There's a lot of force behind this cricket field. And I, there's a lot of pressure. I don't exactly know from where it comes. I understand that, you know, th there are members of the community that want it. But typically, 66% of the community doesn't want it. I want it. I want it to happen. I just want it to be someplace that's nice. But right now, as it stands, what you're doing is saying, well, adult softball, you're out so that cricket can come in. That's not acceptable, right? So, uh, and one of the other things that I noticed that was interesting in the uh, the August meeting was that um, there was kind of the comments, and it's been mentioned here, you know, adult softball is a fragile thing. It seems kind of crazy, but it is. And there was an observation, I know my time, that it was waning. So, okay. Um, but, you know, and you're like, oh, we're bringing people in from other places. So it's not really a Pleasanton activity. Every activity brings people in from other places. If you don't think this cricket pitch is going to do that, you're wrong, right? What's the uh, San Ramon Cricket Association? Are they going to be playing on our, our, our cricket field? It's just the way everywhere, right? So make them a cricket field nice somewhere that's nice and quit fooling around with everybody else. Thank you. Appreciate it. Do we have any Zoom comments? Um, that's the uh, the end of our comment cards as we have in the system. So I believe we move on to item number four. Is that correct? So you would um, just comments since you did questions. If you want to do any comments from commissioners, any comments towards staff? Okay. Um, or additional questions that anyone wants to ask us, okay. we'd be happy to answer those. Um, Commissioner Brown, any questions or comments? And those would typically be directed towards staff. Yeah, um, I I just wanted to point. I just wanted to point out two two things. One is that um, 
adult softball, I think, should be represented in the sports council. I mean, I sat on the sports council for a while as I was Little League president, and I um, I guess I just never realized that they weren't part of that. So maybe that should be something in the future. You should have a representative there for I think for we that. can figure something out. What's unique about adult softball is we run the program with our staff, um, and those other organizations are nonprofits that just leverage the field space. So we'd have to figure out a a way to make that work. Um, but I think there's a possibility for doing that for sure. So then they can get the information. Um, that would be my first thing. And the other thing was, is that when we did vote, I, I, uh, do remember us saying that, that we didn't want to impact a softball, uh, adult softball. Um, and I do think that, uh, the decision that we made to put it at Ken Mercer is a, is still a solid decision. We just need to figure out how we can make things work together. So Long term, we have a great solution for everything working together. Um, the power issue right now is really complicating everything. Commissioner Berberich. All right. So, um, like Commissioner Brown, I actually also um, um, chimed in that we didn't want to move. We did want to move forward with the cricket pitch, but we definitely didn't want want to displace another sport regardless of who the sport was, whether it be a soccer sport, a softball sport, a baseball sport. So I think we all voted at that time to um, move forward with cricket pitch, but also we moved forward with not wanting to displace any other sport. Now, given this um, power deal, I don't know how that impacts the greater picture. Um, but I also took a note, um, you know, I sit on the sports council new with Chuck this year, and I did, I did notice there wasn't representation from you folks on the council. So I don't know if that's something we could think about going forward because I heard what all the speakers said about not having a voice and that's, and I don't feel good about that as a commissioner. And I think that they should, we should try to find an opportunity for them to be able to play this year. That's it. Commissioner Deckard. sports put on pause at that time? Most, yes. Adult softball. Yeah, this question. In 2020, was all outdoor sports on pause? And did adult softball be, be put on pause? It fluctuated throughout 2020. I don't know if Aaron has exact months of when, like the, the state ordinance fluctuated around, and I don't recall. Um, I actually have numbers from various groups, so I can see if we had. And we definitely started in March. Um, so we don't have any numbers from softball in 2020. Um, we do have some numbers, very low numbers from our other youth sports, um, because I think those, you know, parents went and advocated to the state and got programs back um, and they were able to play. But I don't think we were able to stand up our league in 2020. According to our stats, we don't have numbers for that year. So you didn't cancel necessarily any outdoor sports you attempted to put to. Uh... Report here that says uh, spring 2020, 35% canceled due to COVID. And this was a report on April 1st of uh, 2022 that came um, to Ramesh. Okay. Got a chance. Okay. Commissioner Rick Miller. So I'm just wondering what's the difference between starting construction in spring and fall? Because I know that some people who are speaking um, express an interest in starting in fall. Are there different negative impacts that could be in fall besides the delayed construction of a cricket court? I'll lean on Matt for anything construction-wise. So the, the spring or fall question really comes down to what the weather is going to be like and, and whether we want to delay cricket for another six months because in reality if it it could happen in fall maybe we could get it done before the weather um gets stormy but it could also push it you know if there's bad weather then it, it, instead of being fall it's actually winter we can't play on the fields too and then it's going to be spring so it could be pushed more than six months and then programming wise, um, spring and fall have different impacts, but 
equally as heavy of impacts. Um, we usually start back up a, an adult softball league um, late August. Um, so there's softball impacts in the fall as well. Anything else? Um, yeah, I just have one over another question about outreach. So what are the methods of outreach that we're using right now? Because I've seen that the surveys and I'm wondering if there were surveys that went up before that just were not filled out. Or, yeah, yeah. I think um, definitely some lessons learned through this process for us. Um, the, the kind of the process, depending on where you want to pick it up. So we started um, trying to be proactive by reaching out to the adult softball team managers and sending a, hey, we're struggling with a few logistical issues, right? We might have to pause. Um, and then we got hit with the power issue right after that. And so that was the first time we really understood what the construction impacts were, that it was going to be more than just that exact location. And we were wanting to figure out, we do have Title IX requirements. So, um, and baseball fields and softball fields are different. So you can't play a softball game on a baseball field and adult softball fields are bigger than youth softball fields. So there's a lot of complications to all of that. Um, so we just wanted to figure out, okay, how can we start moving people around? And as I showed you with 7,000 people playing these field sports, you move one person and it's a big domino effect. And so we wanted just a little bit of time to pause and we wanted to put in there that maybe potentially cancel this season because we weren't, we just weren't sure where the dominoes were going to fall. So that was our first communication. We thought we were getting out there proactively. It was meant to be a positive, um, like, Hey, just as a, as a, here's where we are, here's what we're trying to work with. Um, but that power issue really is the one that threw the biggest wrench. I think we've, we've solved for impacts, um, were it not for the power issue, but with the power issue, it just really complicates things for an evening league. Well, I want to thank everybody who came out to speak and for sharing your opinions and also thank staff because I know you're working very hard to make sure that we minimize impacts on any sport. Very good. Commissioner Fields. Okay. Um, first of all, how uh, for adult softball, how many innings do they play? Seventy minutes. Uh, seventy minutes or seventy minute time limit. Okay, so um, Ramesh and I were looking at um, the sunsets, and uh, in March the sun sets at um, the early the, the earliest on the twelfth, uh, seven thir uh, thirteen. So uh, and as we progress into April. It's it goes um, quarter to eight, and so uh, could there be a um, and then in May it's eight o'clock. So uh, it, and it progresses on. Um, so is there uh, a way that we the uh, league would be willing to modify, or we could the city could work with the league to modify? the um number of innings or so that possibly they could get two games in uh on two fields my name is Aaron Boyer, I'm the recreation manager um so the, the the effort behind that was uh we also looked at the the setting times uh the amount of daylight we would have um and also with the expected power outage timeline uh we were trying to achieve some consistency so given that uh historically the games have started at 6 30 we thought of pushing it back to six giving some time for people to get off of work and get there um at a comfortable timeline um consistently from late from from spring earlier spring uh the two seasons that would be affected would go into october so it's you know much like a bell curve with your uh, premium daylight. Um, so the beginning and the ends of both sides will be affected. Um, it was questionable whether we can get two games in. Two games is even a smaller scale. Um, I did hear a suggestion that was great. That was uh, you know maybe a different pitch count, maybe speed up the games, um, and they'd be satisfied with one game 
two games, something like that, it would be a much smaller league. Um, our thought was that the weekend would provide more games, more daylight, um, and therefore be able to satisfy on four different four different fields, uh, more overall games and players. So it was basically a sunset um, factor, the sun, this daylight, daylight available. So yes, we did look at that, but it does extend two seasons, um, which is called spring and then uh, summer fall. So, you know, that, that's, that's, that was the reasoning behind it. Okay. So um, another question, uh, if some modifications were made, um, so I'm looking at the softball complex and there's um, two fields that could be used for uh, adult softball and uh, two fields used for youth softball. Correct. Okay. So uh, with that, uh, you would only be able to get two games in a night, correct? At best. Yes. Okay. Yes. Without lights. Yes, yeah. without lights. Okay. And you'd still need the weekends to uh, fulfill that. I we have other other uh, groups interested you, in weekends. But, but yes, we can also have a weekend. Now. You could also use Vernell because they have lights. No, not that's no. Vernell is uh, very impacted, um, as Heidi alluded to. Uh, girls softball utilizes that. It opens up officially for the season. We close the fields for repair and maintenance and growth. It opens up the first week of March, first March 1st. And girls only or girls? Yes. Yeah. It's a very limited space. Girls softball has, uh, you know, quite, a, quite a few girls and they move up there. That is their only space they have. Um, and that is their in season, their prime in season, proper in season. So they go up there. Um, they're able to use the lights. Um, come fall, which is mid-August, it becomes uh, soccer in season properly. And soccer moves up there. And uh, they take it, and then again, it closes for the and season. And they take over that field that's prepped for softball? It's a multi-use field. So it is prepped seasonally for both, for whichever is in season. Okay, so we have four softball um, um, fields at the sports park yes. that, lit, that are just specifically for that. And so we're saying that two of those fields are for youth. Yes. And youth softball or baseball? Softball. So we're just only talking softball. Uh, yes. Youth. Youth softball. Yes. Meaning boys and girls? No, there's girls. Those are girls. Pleasant and girls softball league. Yes. Takes up two of those. Yes, there are multiple teams how many, how per division. Teams are there? Uh, I can look. Softball. Um, I have some stats. Uh, I can I can look right now, but uh, yeah, they have multiple age groups and multiple teams within each age group. Yeah. Okay. So the fields, Joni, um, are they're different for different uses, right? The and the adult well. softball complex is the most dynamic because it's a large field, right? So you can play a smaller game on a larger field. You can't play a large game on a smaller field. Um, the hope, you know, long-term with lights, everything works out, right? Short-term without lights. One of the challenges that we have is that we have exclusive little league fields. Softball is not played on baseball fields because they have mounds. It's a different shaped field. Um, and Title IX requires that we provide equal playing fields for boys and girls. So we have to make sure that in all of this, we are meeting our Title IX requirements and providing equal playing space for boys and girls. I do think, and I will say this out loud, um, with some of the new ideas we've heard tonight with changing the game, I think it might benefit us to sit down with some of the managers and see if we can figure out a new version of softball, right? A shorter version um, based on some new rules and come up with maybe a shorter season um, that that works and fits everyone in there. So I do think that I heard Aaron say he was intrigued by some of those ideas. And um, I would be very open to our team sitting down together and kind of talking about some creative solutions. Okay. Um, and, and again, I know we've all gone through this 
quite a few different times. And I certainly um, feel, um, because my husband played softball at those fields for a very long time. And um, so I, I understand that um, aspect of it. And I, I would hope that the um, men's softball would be willing to um, modify uh, the game a little bit for a short period of time to accommodate everyone that is um, involved. Because it's, it's not just, and um, we, as Steve and Chuck have already said, and Mike, all of us, we have spent a lot of time trying to work it so everyone has a piece of the action. So um, I um, would hope that maybe we can make some modifications and we can get a um, season in for everyone. And um, I, I thank Ramesh for giving me all these timetables. And um, so maybe um, the girls softball has to modify their time also, not just the adults. So uh, it's, it's everybody's got a, a piece of this action and everybody has to make some type of adjustments. Yeah, people have been very agreeable to working with us to get cricket into the park, so. Commissioner Fields, anything else? Nope. Okay. Commissioner Mahdi. Yeah, thank you. And first of all, I want to say like uh, thanks to the staff for kind of thinking like ready to accepting to think, willing to think like out of box and see how we can still have a season if possible uh, for the softball. I think not having any season is no good. Uh, I completely agree. And when we kind of voted for the option, we all <clears throat> thought, never thought that the whole season will be washed out, unfortunately, because of the power and other things. But that's what I was kind of working with <clears throat> Joni and we are kind of looking at like what is the sun sunset time for March, April, May, June, July, August, and September. And I think there should be some like, my request to the softball teams is if based on the daylight saving, if it's not feasible to start in March or in April, at least, summer? yeah, let's kind of at least have one season having two, two games during the, during the weekdays, if possible at the fields and have rest of the games as city staff suggested to have it at weekend, if possible, again, that way, I completely understand once we lose the league, it's hard to get back. And uh, after COVID, we know how hard it is to bring the people back. And uh, wholeheartedly, along with all my fellow commissioners, we want to see the some sort of league uh, going on, whether it's a only one season with reduced number of pitches or modified. We want to keep the league so that it can sustain and have the continuity over the years. Right. That's all from my side. Okay, great. I'm sorry. Um, actually, it's no. yeah, just oh, no, I, it's actually my turn. I know that you'd like to comment. I'm sorry. Um, to wrap up the questioning, as Steve was mentioning earlier, um, and just so that our audience understands, there was absolutely no time that us as commissioners, and I'll speak for us collectively, um, we're looking to throw anybody under the bus. Um, we felt very, very um, forcefully that it was important that the adult softball program would be able to coexist with the, uh, the cricket pitch. And um, I was not going to vote going forward for cricket at all. If that was the case, if 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 the softball, if the adult softball program was in jeopardy, uh, that was that was a that was a a non-starter for me. Um, the big thing that seems to have shifted everything was this power situation, and um, just so the audience understands that behind the scenes there were a lot of conversations about how this happened. How did we have this major disruption in power in our most important part in this park in the city? 
um, from a safety perspective and from a use perspective. So it's it's something I don't have the answer to yet, and I'm not sure if the city has the answer to that yet to find root cause and to make sure nothing like this ever happens again, um, because we all benefit from uh, the Ken Mercer Sports Park. And in, in many ways, more ways than we can think, not just um, athletically, but people just walking their dogs and just walking, strolling through the park and wanting to go there in a safe environment. So it's really important. There's, there's really just so that everybody understands um, this is an important subject and we take, we take it very seriously. Um, on that note, um, one of the commenters mentioned that there is a, um, a deadline looming for registration. So it seems like any kind of a, a solution coming forward is it's on a critical path that we need to look at a solution coming forward. I heard some great comments about modifying the game. Um, that's excellent. I think that there's room here that we want to come to, you know, some compromise that works for everybody. The, the goal is always <clears throat> to, to have everybody working together. Um, a couple of other things really quickly here is <clears throat> one thing I've been, I don't know if we've talked about it on the commission at this point, but there is a document that comes out, I think it's in the Sports Council, and it's uh, something to the effect of use of field. Um, there's a document that is, it, it shows uh, a spreadsheet and it shows what's been reserved on the field. And there's a disconnect between what's reserved and what's actually used. And some of the comments that came out tonight reflect that that you drive by. I did that this summer, this past summer, I would drive by Bernal and it's the peak of Little League season and there is nobody out there at all. And so that is in, in at the beginning of June, end of May and 10 years ago, my son was in Little League. Okay, he played in National and American. And uh, yes, we had Foothill, National American and it was the peak. Um, I did have a conversation with a leader in, um, in Little League last year and um, even though he wouldn't say specifically that um, enrollment was down, he said that the future of very young players was bright. And we're talking about five, six, but that's a long time, um, you know, coming. It's not, it's not here and now. It looks like enrollment is way down in Little League. And we can see it because consolidation, Little League by charter says that um, you can only have a certain amount of of leagues in a community. And so we had a contraction. Instead of three leagues, we now have one league. So just on that evidence alone, we know that Little League enrollment is down. Um, so what I'd like to go to at some point is to have some actual audit. And I think there's been a talk about having an audit of what is actually used. So not just what, what's reserved, but what's actually used. Because as we all know, human nature is, I'm going to reserve a space. And then if there's no recourse, if there's no downside to reserving the space and then not using it, that behavior will continue. So we need to make sure that um, space that's reserved is actually used or it's released so that other programs can use that space. So that's something that I believe that the city is working on at this point. Can you speak to that? I can a little bit. Um, we are hoping to bring forward to you something that we think will be a solution. It mirrors all of our neighboring cities and how they... Um, allocate fields and how they charge for those fields. So we would like to bring that forward to you as a way that we think would really help um, moderate. As far as auditing, we could certainly look into getting a contractor on board, but I think that would be a very expensive process um, to monitor all those fields all day long. And we don't have field monitor staff. Um, Let me follow up on that. Um, instead of having somebody from the outside, would it be something we do maybe in an honor system? And we go to that person that actually reserved that space and then post post time at the end of the month and say how many how many of these sessions were actually utilized and yeah. like on a trust basis that we trust if you want to talk about this in more depth since it's not part of this item um if you all want to right now you can vote to agendize it and we can bring back um a little bit more robust conversation on this we had a discussion in sports council as far as keeping people to the schedule and one of the things that was discussed was instead of uh, right now, there's um, electric signs at at uh, uh, Bernal that aren't working uh, aren't working properly. Um, but instead, having like we do at the parks with a sheet that's put in every day as far as who what teams have reserved and the pesticide signs, and, um, and uh, so that at least when somebody shows up, they can see at six o'clock that Little League's supposed to use that field. And so there's an accountability there that at least they know who is supposed to be using it. And maybe a contact can be made at that point. Yeah. So if you all want to agendize this, we can bring back multiple ideas and then you can add to that idea list as well. Do we need to make a motion on that? Okay. Would somebody like to make a motion? Go ahead. No, go ahead. I make a motion that we uh, bring back the prioritize. prioritizing 
um, the use of fields in, in the future. I'll second that. Okay, so the motion is to um, is to discuss prioritizing the fields in the future. Measuring the usage. And and the use of the yeah and the use of the fields. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's Michelle. Um, let's vote on that, um, Commissioner Brown. Okay, Edith, you're going to do that. I'm sorry, you you play the role. My my mistake. Yes. 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 It'll go in the future, but public comment for this item is already closed. So um, I can share that we will be in contact with all of the softball managers and hope to get something um, scheduled early next week so we can start discussing some modifications to the game to make the the sport work during the evenings. Very good. Thanks for showing up tonight. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, that closes out the softball portion of the meeting. We're going to move on now to um, approving the use of coated rubber infill product manufactured by Cushion Fall Sport at the Bernal Community Park on the all-weather turf sports fields. Getting this report. Uh, regarding items not on the agenda. So your number three is next. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, yes. Uh, do we have any public comments that are not on the agenda on the agenda item? Nothing here, nothing in Zoom. No. Nothing. Okay, it's closing, it's closing. Okay, and now we'll go to item four, is that correct? Oh, so stop share here. And then share again, have to hit screen two, and then share. And then you have to hit the full present again. Try once more. I had to hit it twice. There you go. There we go. We have, we have our screens here. Good evening, commissioners. Um, I'm Giacomo DeMonte, the park maintenance supervisor, as you guys all, all know. Um, so I'm here tonight to uh, talk about um, utilizing a coated rubber um, infill material at Bernal Community Park at the Stanford Medicine Field uh, fields. So this PowerPoint isn't nearly as exciting as some, but I'll do my best to get through it here and hopefully not put everybody to sleep. Um, so I'll just begin by kind of going over some of the background uh, as to how we got here. Um, so the park itself was approved for, for construction in April of 2015. Uh, the turf fields go into service in October of 2016. Um, the original infill material, and I'll get into a little bit more detail about what that is. Um, it, the original infill material is a product called zeofill, which act, is actually a kind of a, it's a mined mineral product. So it's similar in size and feel to um, almost like a kitty litter type of a, a look to it. Um, we added an additional uh, application of the zeofill product in May of 2020 due to complaints of the fields becoming uh, slippery. Um, these concerns uh, resurfaced again last year um, from some of the, the user groups that the fields were again becoming slippery and, and not performing as they did when they were um, installed or, or at least newer. Uh, we did end up having a sport uh, testing company come out and uh, do some testing on the fields. One of those tests was to uh, assess um, basically the traction of the fields, and they use this mechanism here to to measure the amount of torque that it took to move uh, simulated cleats in the turf. And they did it at several spots on all three fields. So that re that revealed that 
although it was still within, I believe, FIFA standards, it was on the low end of acceptable for, for traction. So with that, we knew we had a real a case that we needed to add some more infill material, which tends to in, improve traction. Um, so a little bit on infill. So it can be comprised of many things. Um, and more and more products are being, or I, you know, different materials are being used for this infill. Um, this is for synthetic, you know, turf fields. Some people use the old term astroturf if you're um, of an older generation like myself. Uh, so rubber, rubber of different types. Um, one of those is uh, like a crumb rubber. One is called EPDM, I believe. I always get that acronym wrong. There's cork, there's olive pits, there's coconut fiber. There's actually a new wood product um, that I've heard of. Uh, there's blends that contain, contain uh, hemp as part of it. And then there's mineral products like zeophyll. Um, some turf systems have multiple layers of infill or different infill blends. So they can take two of these different products and blend them together. So basically it goes in between the turf blades to help them stand up. Uh, it assists in the traction, uh, so players have more um, dependable footing uh, as they're playing. And um, they're applied in various depths depending on the type of under of turf system that you're using. <clears throat> so just like carpets in your home, they have different pile heights, different lengths of the of the grass blades. Um, and then this infill material can re require replenishment over time as part of a normal maintenance program. So this is kind of a mock-up of, of um, I can't use my, my mouse doesn't appear up there. So this is kind of a mock-up of, of what, a, what a turf field is comprised of. Basically, our, you would have a, a underlying shock pad, almost like your uh, carpet pad at home, um, some form of a backing, uh, the infill material, and then obviously the carpet or the blades of simulated grass themselves. Sometimes um, there's multiple layers of material. Oftentimes you'll see some fields will have a layer of sand and then a layer of more cushioned infill material. So in September of 2022, uh, we went to city council and they approved a little over $168,000 for infill replenishment. Uh, on October 21st, before we, we were gonna implement any installation of any, uh, or the project got off the ground, we received uh, an email from the sports council groups with concerns uh, with the use of the zeophil product. Um, you know, the, the concerns really revolved around um, the abrasions that the players were receiving, um, the poor traction, and then there's also concerns just about the longevity of the product. Where is this material going um, as it as the fields are getting used? It seems to kind of decrease and then um cause this issue with traction um so we you know hearing those concerns we paused the product uh, project and we started to research more uh, infill alternative products um so we reached out to the, to the original installation vendor who was valley precision grading uh we also talked to the representatives from astroturf who is the manufacturer of the turf field and itself um we did obtain uh, samples and pricing for six products, and those were uh, a product called GeoCool Infill, uh, Emerim Ice Organic, which is a cork and olive pit blend, Cushion Fall Sport, which is the coated rubber that, that um, well, I'll get to that, uh, Green Play, which was a cocoa fiber or coconut core, C-O-I-R, core product, uh, EPDM rubber, uh, which is just another formulation of a rubber product, and then the zeophil product that we are off, that we have at the fields now. Um, all the products have pros and cons, and those were listed in your agenda packet. Um, you know the the organic products, those being the uh, cork and olive pit and and cocoa fiber. There were some real concerns by our vendor that those materials would be really hard to get into the existing. Uh, blades of the artificial grass. Number one, because our blades are, are fairly short and dense. And number two, just because of the age of the fields. I feel like those products are probably better suited for a new installation with the, a different type of underlying artificial grass. Um, 
there was concerns with uh, the geofill it was a very fine product. It almost looked like uh, sand, you know, very fine sand. And uh, the concern there is that would fill any existing voids in the current infill. And we might have to continue to add more material as we fill those voids and then finally overcome those voids and then start to build up from there. Uh, so that kind of left EPDM. So there's two issues that we saw with the EPDM. Uh, one was there was a there's a phenomenon where the material kind of, I wouldn't say so much melts, but starts sticking together and you kind of get these clumps of material. Um, and then also it's very cost prohibitive. It was almost uh, double the cost of what we had budgeted. And then we all know that the drawbacks of zeofill obviously are they, it's abrasive. It doesn't tend to last a long time. Um, but on the flip side, is it is a natural product. Um, and then the other thing we looked at is what would kind of work well with a six-year-old field. I mean, this is a little bit of uncharted territory, um, at least for us. So with that, we, we provided samples and information sheets, uh, cost estimates, the pros and cons, and uh, lists were made available to members of the public or essentially the Sports Council and the Park and Rec Commissioners from November 22nd to December 2nd for comparison. So you can go and take a look at the samples. I might have left the sample in my car <laughs> that I was going to bring with me. Um, um, so we only received two common cards from that that uh, kind of um, period of time. Both preferred the coated rubber product. Um, with that, we started moving forward with more research on the coated rubber product. Um, it was also the the vendor's preferred product um, for improving traction. And uh, the vendor gave us two uh, other resources to call upon. One was Sierra College. And the other was University of San Francisco, both of which are using the this current infill material, this coated rubber product. So with that, uh, we took a field trip over to USF or University of San Francisco to check out their fields and uh, and also reached out to Sierra College by phone, uh, Sierra College in Rockland. So this is a picture of the USF fields, which I'd never been to USF. It's it's a, a cool area. Pictures aren't very exciting when we're talking about this stuff, so my apologies. So, <laughs> um, so we visited USF and, and we met with their assistant athletic director, um, who was very accommodating. You know, gave us great great amount of attention and information, and he also uh, hooked us up with uh, a former women's team goalkeeper and a men the men's soccer head coach to uh, to get their feedback on this infill material. Um, they had very positive feedback and, and the, you know, they really stressed how it was much, uh, a great improvement over their last field. Uh, Sierra college had similar, uh, feedback, you know, the athletic trainer who was probably the ones that, you know, are the ones that dealing with the injuries that may occur from abrasions or other, um, you know, slipping acts, you know, slipping sprains or, 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 uh, I don't know, bumps and bruises, whatever you want to say. Um, they haven't had any issues and they haven't had any complaints from the athletes. So one is a junior college, one's a division one school. Um, so I thought that was a pretty good feedback. Now, remember the feedback from these school, these different organizations or different uh, facilities is the entire turf system. So it's kind of the carpet itself plus the infill. So it's a little hard to separate those two out when you, when you play on a field, you don't say, hey, that was great in infill, you know, you say oh, that was a great field. So it's a little hard to to kind of uh, pull those things apart, you know. Um, so we did uh, talk to Sports Council just this Monday about uh, wanting to move forward with this coated rubber product and and wanted to get their feedback on it. Um, there were some concerns from from Cricket for Cubs about the potential increase in the ball bounce from this material because the the coated rubber has a little bit more of a a, a spring to it. Um, most of the organizations had concerns over the unknown outcome of changing the infill material. So this is uncharted territory. So they were a little nervous about a 
you know, changing 325,000 square feet of, of turf and not knowing that, you know, adding this material, not knowing the outcome. So their feedback basically boiled down to uh, creating a test area prior to the installation of this material on all the fields. And uh, our vendor uh, is willing to do that, um, to create a, a test area using the proper rate so that um, anybody can go out there and see what the look and the feel and how this area would perform once it's installed in the rest of the field. So with that, our, our staff recommends the approval of the coated rubber product. And we'd be happy to, uh, I guess, you know, based on your, um, I don't know the term blessing, we can do the, <laughs> we can do the the test patch, and then have the members of sports council provide feedback to speed up the process. It would be nice since the sports council only meets on a quarterly basis. Would be to um, somehow have them give their opinion of it prior to moving forward with the full installation, um, but maybe not having to bring it back to, uh, we can obviously come back and give that feedback to you next month or um, somehow provide you feedback from the the, the user groups that predominantly use uh, the Stanford medicine fields. So, the coated rubber, you know, from our from our point of view, meets several critical goals. One, it's it should improve traction, um, should have better longevity, and it's within the budget that was already approved by city council. So this is really a situation where the uh, Park and Rec Commission is making the decision on whether or not we move forward with this. Uh, council has already approved the money. I checked with the city attorney. We don't need to go back to council as long as the product that we choose or select is within the, the budget. If we want to look at a different product that exceeds the budget, then we would have to go back to city council and request additional funds for that material. So with that, that concludes. Um, yep, I think that concludes all my slides. So any questions or comments? Should we let's open up to Commissioner questions? Commissioner Brown. Um, yes, I know there's um <clears throat> sorry, I don't know what's wrong with my voice today. Um, I know I know some of our neighboring um cities have um um turf fields. My son plays field hockey on, in Livermore. Do they have the same issue? Um, or do you know what they use? You know, I'm not familiar with what Livermore uses. I know what I've seen in Danville and San Ramon, and they have a similar um, kind of a crumb rubber product. Um, what sets this apart slightly is that it does have a coating around it. So that um, does kind of encapsulate the rubber. So all the negative aspects or concerns of the rubber product, you know, whether that's uh, zinc or dust or um, volatile organic compounds whatever that rubber comes with is encapsulated by this material so that's the that's the advantage of the coating of the coated rubber plus the color it's not 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 a black color it's more of a dark green but i'm not sure specifically what livermore uses if i had to guess it was probably if it's black it's going to be a crumb rubber product um i believe dublin uh also has i, I think at their fallon park they have the, the black rubber as well very it's very very common okay. yeah thank you that's my only question okay great um commissioner Burish. no question commissioner deckert uh first i want to state that um i was at the monday sports council meeting so please know that i'm keeping an open mind uh with regards to the item tonight so um First of all, I wanted to thank publicly Erin Sharp for the director of coaching at Ridge. She's the one that brought this to fore with us as far as the injuries that some of her players were having, especially the goalies uh, with abrasions. Uh, she had um, some very strong, she sent uh, quite a few of us uh, an email back then. Um, and I ran into her at a Rage event and where she expressed the same concerns to me um, uh, at that event that um, they were wanting to get to, they felt the zeal fill was not a good solution for soccer in terms of injury and as far as planting. Um, and then she took the time to write a very extensive email expressing those concerns back in October that I think brought this to where we are today. Um, the two speaker cards that were filled out, I think were both 
from Aaron and from Ballistic. Uh, I know at the Sports Council, they were both very supportive of at least moving forward with the, um, the rubber infill. So to me, that is all that matters to me is that the two people that pay, play the field sports um, are um, what they're supportive of, what they feel is, is the best solution. And they both were, were with the, if, again, they were also very um, passionate about having a trial period so they can understand that there's not going to be an issue with uh, the, the change out of the infill. Um, so with, with that, I think that was um, what I needed to hear from that on uh, Monday night was the fact that uh, both those, um, both Ballistic and Rage were supportive moving forward with this new infill. Anything else? Oh, and one question for you. Uh, you mentioned that um, the field's six years old, and you mentioned a 10-year number at the meeting Monday. Is that 10 more years or four more years to get to 10 years? You know, it's interesting because I was I was thinking about that on the way home, and I think I probably overestimated the, the longevity or what's left in those fields. I think best case scenario, we hope to get 10 more years out of 10 them. 10 more years. Okay. Yeah, but I think realistically, it's probably closer to eight. Yeah. Right. I think if we can hit eight, we've really got our 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 life out of those fields yeah thank you everybody that comes to look at the fields you know whether it was astroturf or our vendor you know they they do stay that they're in really good condition they look to be i walk by them every morning they look to be in very good yeah condition, so. i know there's probably around the goals uh and, and the entrances obviously those are the areas that take the the biggest beatings thank you. Okay. commissioner Rittmuller. so with the testing period would there be a solid period of time before it is officially decided upon to use this infill or would it look like a very quick turnaround um that's a good question i would i would like to put some kind of um kind of parentheses parentheses around the amount of time so it doesn't drag on too long but the reality is is you know um you know we're doing this to improve the playability for our user groups and if they want longer to assess that that test area it it only delays the solution a little bit longer. So we we wouldn't have any problem with that. As we move farther into the spring and summer, the vendors start to get busier and busier and we might have to wait long in, in a longer line until our project gets uh gets on their on their short list, I guess. So but yeah, there's no real, you know, a month, three weeks, whatever, whatever we think is is uh and you guys could also put some time frame around that as well, if you like. Thank you. Great. Commissioner Fields. Well, since I was one of the two that went and looked and felt the uh, different uh, fills, um, you said that um, was San Francisco State, are you? USF. USF. Was their uh, field the same length as ours? No, it was actually a different, different underlying turf product. So, the way the the density of the blades, the length of the blades mm -hmm. was different. So it wasn't. You're not starting with the same system to add the infill to. It was a different system of. of what did they have? Um, had they already had an infill, a, more than once. Not on this field. So this field, the field that they're playing on now was a new, was a replacement for an older field where they were having issues with traction and slipping. So um, I think Aaron might have alluded to that they might have had a field with Zeo Phil at one point, but I, we didn't, the, the athletic, the assistant athletic director didn't, didn't know what the previous field was. Oh, okay. But uh, no, it's a whole new system. Um, they're they are playing in a very damp and moist environment as you can imagine being towards ocean beach so you know that said they're 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 happy with the traction and actually the other night when i went by Bernal community park on monday in the evening you could see that fog almost settling down right onto the field so maybe not that dissimilar to uh to san francisco how large would the uh patch be um for for people to go and look at Initially with the vendor, we were thinking about a 10 foot by 10 foot area. So about a hundred square feet. So two plus by 10 area. Yeah. And the test area would go in between what we call what is this the CTS field and the four leaf field. So there's kind of an area where the light poles are. That's, you know, if it turns out to be a complete disaster, we didn't put it in the middle of the field, you know. 
Okay. So, but they had both felt, or, you know, I think everybody at council felt that that was a good compromise and they'd still use that, that area for practicing and, and could, could get a good feel for it without, you know, jeopardizing the prime time. Okay. Uh, footprint um, of the field. And looking at the uh, council gave us or gave your department 160,000, correct? And we're looking at 102. Uh, if I'm looking at this right, uh, estimated cost. Let me just double check here on my. Oh, grand, a grand total, 140, 142. Right. Yeah. yeah. I try to. So break out. Uh, do we get, do we get that money for something else? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's actually coming out of our existing um repair and replacement fund so it would just it wouldn't leave the account in the first place i guess yeah well i but, was just wishing yeah, yeah. <laughs> come on um uh, very so, good yeah so it falls within the, the the budget and we could probably actually you know i i, I don't know if we're not putting any more material in but i think we're putting what we need to put in with that dollar value so it's not like we're um less because we don't want to go over the budget we're putting them in the proper amount and it just happens to fall within the budgeted amount so uh there, are there different levels on the field that have to be filled more than uh other parts because of uh traffic Exist to play? existing where yeah um i don't think so i think they try to spread it out as evenly as they can um but you know, honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I, they could spend or or use a little bit more material where they know the wear is the worst. Okay. And and part of that analysis that the testing agency did is they measured the infill depth over, I think, 40 spots per field. So, and they did vary. You are right. I mean, some of the areas were lower infill amount and some areas were high, depending on where they were on the, the footprint of the field. Um, we could definitely provide that information to the vendor and see if it's of any use. And I just don't know how precise they are with when they start spreading material out, if they can target an area for more or less. I'm I'm just really uh, pleased with the, the choice, especially that um, it is being sealed. And so we don't have that um, fear of exposure to some of the chemicals. So, yeah, I think that's the intent of the actual coding itself. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Mahdi. So I just want to kind of clarify. I, I made a comment on this item on, I was at, I was there at Monday evening sports council meeting and in my role with the cricket for cups. And I made some comments on this item and uh, I want to and please uh, I want to let you guys know that I'll keep an open mind regarding this item tonight uh, for any discussion. And having said that, uh, I don't have any questions on this item. Very good. Steve, I know you have one additional question at least. Yeah, actually, I, want, um, I wasn't sure if this is the right time to do, but I was actually at the sports council as well. So um, I'm definitely keeping an open mind on uh, the selection. Yeah, and I was thinking about it as well i mean it's not it's different than a, a field that is 100 percent infill being rubber i think you'll get a much more of a bounce versus us adding it to an existing field that already is pretty pretty firm so we'll see how the test area turns out but i'm i'm optimistic that it'll be you know hopefully it'll serve the cricket community just as well okay i actually have no questions Thank you. All right. Thank you. We need public comment first, Chuck. Thank you. I'm sorry. Do we have any speaker cards, Edith? No speaker cards. Okay. You can speak and then fill out a card afterwards. Let's do that. Come on up. Nathan Barrow. <laughs> I played on this field several times. I play uh, soccer as well. And uh, I can tell you that the infill material you have is, is uh, very sharp, right? And so I've experienced some of these injuries 
myself. And if you want to know where it goes, it comes home with us in our socks and our shoes. So yeah, the the little what is it? Zeophil is like a little like bricky pebble, uh, kind of white in color. Yeah, that stuff's dangerous. Uh, I, I I do see what you're saying that it um, yeah, it does have a certain bounce to it that you don't see on some of these other rubber fields. Um, and I I didn't catch the uh, I didn't know if there was an assessment on the toxicity. Of the, of the other film material, but that's that is that considered non toxic? Can I? Is, so you just need to finish your public comment, and if yeah. Commission wants to ask the question, okay. we just have well, to direct all comments. You're, you're talking about the toxicity, is that what you're saying? Yeah, okay. right, because I played on other fields out in Danville, and they have a different fill, which is just kind of the chopped up rubber stuff. And there are, you know, obviously cancer concerns, cancer risks with that. And so I'm just curious if, you know, there's a cancer risk with this. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. I guess I'll, I'll share that question. Is there some, you know, talk of it being non-toxic or what's, does, is the coating uh, protecting uh, humans against problems? Yeah, as part of the, the agenda packet, there is some information from the vendor that shows that the amount of volatile organic compounds is reduced with this coating. And uh, the material that leaches out of the rubber is is reduced with this coating. So, um, the term, you know, non-toxic non is a little difficult to pin down. I wouldn't want to, you know, um, give an opinion on on the, what that term means, but I think it's safer than an uncoated product. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. Okay. Um, should we go to a motion on accepting this? Yeah, let's first see. Do we have any uh, participants via Zoom? I'm sorry, say it again. Just Oh, any Zoom comments? Nothing? No. Okay. Does that all make a motion that we approve the use of the coated rubber infill product uh, manufactured by Kitchen Falls Sports at Bernal Community Park on the all weather surface coast field? Do we have a second? Uh, I'm going to repeat that. Uh, uh, that like that was so well said, Chuck. I know. I'd like to make a motion we approve the use of the coated rubber infill product manufactured by Cushion Falls Sport. At the Bernal Community Park on the all weather turf sports fields. I, I would like to add something to the motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have added also you know, that uh, we that that's with in, in understanding that we're going to do a trial period. And I'd like to put a bracket on the trial period that we keep that within one month period. Okay. And can we make sure we get we hear the feedback from the sports council or users on that before? That because we don't want to end up with the same situation where say, hey, guy, oh, you guys approved and that was the plan, right? If you want to, do you want to try to help guide this the motion with all these different nuances? So I think, um, Commissioner Amadi, if I'm hearing you correctly, what you are hoping to do is um, have feedback from the sports council before we make the decision, um, or is it just? we get enough feedback positively, we go forward, we get enough negative feedback, we bring it back. I'm talking, alluding to the later part. If, if there is a, enough positive feedback, just go ahead, not bringing back to us. If there's a negative feedback, obviously back that, to the- That was the whole reel for the trial period, yeah. yeah. So what do you consider like if nine out of 10, say it's great one person says no are we a go are you wanting any negative feedback to come back to you first it's, and then we can just clarify that in the motion before we before we move on do we want do we want to do we want a majority of or do we want one or two being able to stop the um the go the go ahead i think i think it's a majority piece. Majority. Okay. Okay. Majority. okay. Great. So do you want to restate that, restate. Chuck? Let's restate the motion that we approve the use of the coated infill product manufactured by Cushion Fall Sports uh, at the Bernal Community Park on the all-weather sports fields with the understanding that we're going to have a trial period with a, on one field and that um, with that, um, if there is a favorable opinion among the field sports users, uh, by the majority that we move forward with it. Otherwise, if, if if we don't have a majority that it comes back to the sports council and the commission um, within my month. Yeah. I second it. We have a second. 
Yes. Yes. Okay. Who is the second? Ramesh. And then we'll do a roll. <clears throat> yes. 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 Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Moving right along, we're going to go to item number five, which is the review and comments on the July, September 2022 Library and Recreation Department quarterly report. Great. I have some highlights and then I have an observation that I'd love to share with you and get your feedback on. Um, so we've been doing these quarterly reports for a while. And um, some highlights for me this time around was summer reading, um, including the the question Joni asked earlier, what the heck is Camp Cheerio? Um, it was a stuffed animal sleepover camp that we hosted at the library. Some awesome photos, great, great joy throughout that program. Um, our drama programs continue to sell out in civic arts. So our Pleasanton Youth Theater Company is amazing. We sell out most often within the first 10 minutes of registration for summer um, and spring, which is pretty exciting. Uh, our day trippers are back for the senior programs, which is wonderful as well. So these are the day trips to um, things like baseball games, museums, um, places that we can take folks um, for just one day, not an overnighter. Um, the survey results for our Ridge Runners program continue to be incredibly high. That is also another program that sells out very quickly. Um, our specialty classes, I just wanted to highlight, um, these are really the biggest revenue generator for our department. Um, so we do try to continue to find new contract classes. These are programs that also expand our offerings, things that we can't necessarily do with our own internal staff, um, people who come in with fine arts skills and you know, karate or taekwondo skills um, all over the place, archery, dance. Um, so that's really exciting that we're able to expand our offerings that way and also generate some revenue. Um, and then aquatics, um, if you have never been to the Boat Box Derby, I would highly encourage you to come. It is the most fun event that I have ever been to. The kids spend time building their boats out of boxes and then they race them across the pool. We have lifeguards in the water with them, but it is so fun and so cute. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. With that, um, it's my intention to move towards just an annual report rather than the quarterly report. I'm finding, um, at least for me, the, the trends that we're able to put in there, the budget data um, is a lot more telling of a story. And the time it takes to put together these quarterly reports, for me, um, while the data is interesting and fun, I think those annual reports share a lot more um, of what we're looking to share. So um, I know we've been doing the quarterly reports for a while and they do help um, fill out the annual report, but I do find our annual report to be very, um, very insightful. And we just don't have the capacity to get those trend lines and things like that into the quarterly report. So with that, I'm willing to take any feedback that you have for me or questions. Any questions? I'll make that. Questions. Yeah. <clears throat> So I do like, I like the, the presentation of this. I like it's all on one page. I can see everything I need to see. I have to fumble through a, a thick document to find the information we're looking for. Um, so what's the annual, is the annual going to look like this as well? Or, or are we talking about like a thick book? No, it looks very much like this. You just got one in, um, what month are we in now? So we go through June. I think you got one in like in September. I'll have to look back and figure it out, but um, it's slightly longer because it has a little more data. So it folds in, you know, a little bit about what we do in each area, it folds in the budget numbers, and then it shows some trend lines year over year, which I think is interesting, right? Are our numbers going up or our numbers going down? Are people liking this program? We usually do some highlights from some surveys. So some quotes in there as well. Um, so it is slightly longer, but not a huge tome or anything. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Commissioner? Commissioner Fields. Of course I do. Um, I uh, called Heidi the other day because I had several questions. Um, and for those that are new on the commission, the senior center, um, they have two different types of trips 
that are um, offered to uh, seniors. And one is sponsored through um, the city, which would be um, the day trips. And then the other is offered by the VIPs, which is a club within the senior center. So, and those are like going to the casinos, doing um, a larger a trip type thing. So for you guys that haven't, aren't seniors, um, it, it, it's really kind of a, a neat thing to go down there and see the different um, pro, uh, programs that are being offered. But um, I, I had to ask Heidi because going back, there wasn't any a long a long time ago in a, a world so far away from us. Um, there uh, was a small group that were VIPs that started the whole um, senior uh, outreach. I'm going to say an outreach. It was at the vets hall. And so those people are the ones who started these little trips and they started the bingo and they started all of this. So now the city with their great uh, facility have just, I mean, it, it's so great the the different things that are there and there are health um programs uh, that are there also for the people and there's the senior auto safety class that's offered and it is in your um whatever this thing is guide <laughs> activities guide so uh there's there's a lot of things that um aren't just sports so, um, yeah, and you, she answered all my questions for me. So, thank you. Yeah, questions. Um, great job um, recovering from a pandemic year where I think a lot of us were concerned about how many, uh, like almost softball address today, is to, would come back from a pause and to see some of the numbers that um, I know the big number jumps from last time you provided this quarter really report. Um, I think is is a lot can be said for your department and how they structure the programs to uh, make them appealing to the people of the residents. Um, the one the one thing that uh, I participated in um, uh, this year since I've been retired is the uh, I'm one of those four thousand one hundred forty four contract class participants that, taking part of Flow Yoga on Wednesdays with Amy and uh, which has uh, really improved my core uh, flexibility. And I uh, would recommend for any of you that read, um, I've been taking part in the uh, the winter and uh, now the summer reading program and i just finished my bingo card so it's all it's all it's all good stuff that's good chuck very good yes question um i, I was just going to make a comment you asked about feedback of having this not quarterly but doing it yearly and um maybe it might be something half a year just to kind of give a small update but just a thought i mean I feel like we just got something like this. So I do feel like, oh, wait, didn't I just see something? So it seems a little quick, but maybe a, a half year. Because I just, it, it just it's nice to see all the numbers and like, oh, that's cool. But I'm I'm open. Thank you. Commissioner Ramadi. Commissioner Ramadi. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just trying to understand under, under the li library services, we have adult programs. We offered 14 programs, but we see only 97 attendees. In 14 programs and just trying to understand what is that and how we can kind of bring much more attendees to those programs and so this is something um that is we've been trying to bring back post pandemic and something that we're trying to do a little bit more in collaboration with our other divisions um we did have a lot of overlap between our previous adult programs and recreation programs. And so trying to make sure we're not duplicating. Um, this is an area that we have not brought back entirely since the pandemic. Um, we're not doing the same level of weekend programs. We have the construction project, the roof project. Our meeting room is not available on a regular basis right now because it's open and then it's closed. And then, you know, depending on where the construction's going on. But this is something that you will see once we get our roofing project done and once we get fully staffed back up. Um, that we will be able to bring back um, our adult programs in some shape or form. They may be more collaborative with other departments, which you'll see um, this month. We're doing a Lunar New Year celebration in conjunction with the Firehouse Arts Center. 
Um, so you'll start to see a little bit more of that and we'll figure out how we how we count those numbers so we're not double counting them. Um, so we might have maybe a more like collaborative department wide section when we bring that data back to you. And uh, last question, do we ask our community saying that they would like to see any different programs than we offer? We do. So every time I'll answer that in a few ways. Every time we do a program, we survey the program. And in there is, are there other programs you'd like to see? Um, we also, we've tried community-wide surveys, things like that, um, moving forward. And when we did as part of our strategic plan, so we're hoping as we move forward, we'll continue to get more info. Um, one thing we'd like to do is figure out how to get information from people who aren't coming. Um, but that's been a little harder to do, so... We're hopeful that maybe through the citywide strategic planning process, which was approved by council, that we'll be able to leverage some of that to ask some library and recreation specific questions about what people would want to see. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Rittmiller. I just have a comment about the annual report. I agree that it does feel a little bit recent since we've seen a report, and I'd assume that because it's not on a yearly basis as of now, that a lot of the stats don't change significantly between each quarter. So I would be in support of looking at an annual report, but I'm open to whatever the other commissioners are interested in. Thank you. Yeah, I like the idea of a, a short, uh, maybe semi-annual, just a little briefer in there too as well. And then go to the annual, my take on that. Any other comments? Okay. okay, let's go into commission reports. Um, we have several, and uh, we'll start with the Bicycle Pedestrian Trails Committee. Um, I'm the chair, in that, and we don't have a meeting until January 23rd, so I'll have an update for, for that on next month. Community of Character. That I know. <laughs> we just had a meeting yesterday. And um, the first thing up that I would I like to um, make everyone aware, and I have given you all uh, flyers, is on Saturday is Make a Difference Day, which uh, the Community of Character is one of the co-sponsors. And um, that is um, uh, 29 different volunteer nonprofits will be there. It's at the senior center. Um, it it shows it, it, they will have the fire department. Uh, depends on how much it rains. If we have anything outside, but inside we, uh, they have emergency packets. They'll show you how to uh, you know assemble those. They will um, also have um, opportunities for students to sign up for like their um, hours of, of community service. And there, there's just a lot of um, open heart kitchen. There's just lots and lots of different areas that people can um, attach and uh, go and find out about. And then our um, this year on the 29th, uh, which is the Monday after Martin Luther King uh, legal holiday, uh, Community of Character sponsors the Martin Luther King Fellowship Breakfast, which will be the first time in, this will be with, uh, prior to COVID. And it will be at, um, it's Livermore, Pleasanton, and uh, Dublin. And the speaker will be Dr. Will Nelson, who was is an assistant superintendent uh, of teaching and learning in the Pleasanton School District. We have three uh, award winners, Kelly uh, Laduca, Matt, uh, who was um, the president of the community of character, also ran the Y for 10 years and was also the CEO of Hively. Uh, Matt Torino, who uh, does for Dublin, does the Thanksgiving dinner every year, which is a uh, done at St. Raymond's Church. 
And then a Ronnie Forbes, who is a former military person who has um, done a food bank and a storage and started a warming center for uh, the city of Livermore. The cost is uh, $40 and you can uh, register at pleasanton.org. And it's a, um, we have Creatures of Impulse will be doing um, some of the uh, music for it at the beginning. And- but the High School Music Collaborative maybe? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that's through Mark Dun Duncanson. Uh, so I, I really encourage you um, to uh, come. It's eight o'clock in the morning at a dead, the Devil Tree uh, by Hilton. And the proceeds go to the Juanita Hagen Memorial Scholarship for local students. And last year we gave two $1,000 uh, scholarships to Amador and two to Foothill. So... Um, I encourage you to come and listen to Dr. Will Nelson talk about diversity. Excellent. Okay. Next is Heritage Tree Review Board, and I attended that meeting. Uh, last month, we had one case with a um, contention um, between the city and the, um, the homeowner um, near the uh, Calipe Golf Course. Um, the issue has been extended. It's uh, uh, there's an extension as far as a corrective action until uh, late summer, early fall of this year. And so um, that was um, extended amicably on uh, on both sides. And that's all I have on that. Uh, public art selection subcommittee. Nothing? There haven't been any meetings. Okay, got it. And sports council. Sports council, we... Um... Pretty much covered it uh, on our uh, earlier tonight with most of the uh, infill was the primary subject uh, at that meeting. Um, some things then, Jack, could let me know if I make any mistakes with some of these numbers, but um, I'm right, I'm right here, Johnny. Um, the um, naming contracts um, for Leaf and CTS, um, we're making good progress with, I think, one of them. Uh, Four leaf paid in full, um, and then, or is it is that CTS paid in CTS paid in full? Actually, I think didn't they? Um, yeah. More importantly, the four leaf CTS were making very good progress with um, working out the contractual arrangements and getting the funding from them to complete their um, obligation. Stanford is more complicated um, since it is a seven year deal. Uh, we and there's so many entities with Stanford. They are running to some headway with them, trying to get some of those contracts in place, but they're confident that it'll get done eventually. Um, all the athletic fields were aerated recently. That's correct. Yeah. Yes, as part of our fall renovation, yeah, they were all aerated and some of them even multiple times and uh, top dress with compost. Yeah. <laughs> And lastly, regarding the cricket pitch, once once the construction starts, uh, it'll make soccer field number six inaccessible until um, uh, June or whatever the month after that, depending on when when the cricket pitch construction starts. So that was um, something that Aaron may mention of during the meeting. Um, but then they continue to then they will be able to continue to go go back and play using field six in the fall. All the leagues understood that, and there didn't seem to be any concern about field six being made. Uh, inaccessible. So that's it. Okay. Okay. Do we have any other reports of meetings, conferences, seminars attended by any commission members? Just like to note that you do have your CPRS magazines. They are finally coming in. So that's great. Those are interesting just for you to review. That's the California Park and Rec Society um, magazine there. So Good. we also have the uh, Pleasanton Guide and um, I took the photo on the cover and you'll no notice that is the Wu family and um, they were a very easy family to work with that night and uh, it was nice that they chose a family that does make use of the library quite often and and um, and so anyway that's uh, I just like the way it came out. Do we have any issues that uh, commissioners would like to initiate? Actually I have I have something. Okay. Is this the appropriate time to make a comment about the pickleball? Oh. 
Well, not really, no, because it's not agendized unless you want to, this would be the section where you bring up items that you want to put on the agenda in the future and then you vote on them. If you have something about pickleball you want to talk yeah, about I offline, just... I can certainly do that with you. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to give kudos to the, the staff. I thought oh. that the pickleball. I'll take that. Yeah. I thought the pickleball <laughs> courts were very professional. Yeah, there you go. And they looked really good. There were several of us that were there. And um, I think that uh, exceeded uh, at least my expectations on on the court. So I think staff did a great job. And residents feel the same. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Go ahead. So, uh, thank you, sir. And uh, so I would like to kind of uh, bring back an agenda item in what form or shape. I don't know. I will let the staff decide. We have some learning from this whole like softball season cancellation. My suggestion is we bring back our agenda item to look at the process in which this kind of programs, which is impacting lot of people before it is cancelled, I think we need to weigh in how to kind of salvage up, look at the options before addition is made to cancel the season completely for a whole year if it is impacting. That so I just want to remind people the season was never cancelled, right? We brought forward a weekend plan. We brought forward a, hey, we're going to have to postpone it. We're working it out. We never cancelled the season. We would not cancel a program without bringing it to Park and Rec as an agenda item. Um, so we can certainly in the future, but we did, we never, and I, I just want to reiterate that staff never canceled the softball program. We were just trying to figure out in the scope of all of this stuff going on, how are we going to make it work? We wanted to give people a heads up, trying to be proactive, trying to have great customer service. Um, but of course, we're not going to cancel programs such as that without commission input, right? Thank Adult you. softball or things like that. So that would come before you already. Okay. Anything else? Anybody on commission? No. Steve, you mentioned you had an agenda item you wanted to bring forward. Uh, actually, I I I, uh, I talked to another commissioner about that. I think we're in good shape. All right. Sounds good. You guys are clear. Yeah. Okay. Okay. A future agenda items. We have the skate park still on our agenda. Doggy bags throughout city parks. One of my favorite issues. And um, Cubby's Dog Park Restroom. Those are all for the future. And you added this evening the field allocation options, recommendations. We'll figure out a title, but basically how can we get more equity, more people on the fields? Exactly. Yeah, and and I think a part of it was the kiosks weren't working. That's only at Burnell. That's only at the synthetic turf fields. We do not have that at any other park. And that's a small number of our fields there. So, and that's just the synthetic turf fields, the three fields there that have the kiosks. But I think that will be an option, right? If you want some type of weekly signage um, posted at everyone, we can bring back kind of a, a various set of different ideas and concepts moving forward. Okay. Okay. With that said, I believe this meeting is now. Adjourned. I think you need a motion to do that, sadly. Oh, I wanted to hit that gavel. You want to get that down, though. You want a motion to adjourn this meeting. I'll motion to adjourn. Get the motion. I'll second. Do you have a second? Yeah, second. No, I can do uh, that. Oh, Edith has told us that the chair makes the motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. I second it. Do we do we have to vote or no? Nope, that's it. With that said, this meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>